So welcome everyone today to Mara's guest lecture. And our guest lecturer is Robert F. Smallwood. He's the managing director for the Institute for Information Governance at iMERGE Consulting. And uh, Robert is an industry uh, leader uh, as far as being an author, keynote speaker, consultant, and educator in the field of information governance, electronic records management. Uh, he is the author of the text we're using for our information governance course, information governance governance concepts, strategies, and best practices. And uh, he has three other books out, and we just heard about a, an executive uh, edition of the IG book that will be come out, coming out in December. Uh, his other book that you may be very familiar with is Managing Electronic Records, uh, Methods, Best Practices, and Technologies. Uh, and then there's another one very closely related on safeguarding critical e-documents. Uh, Robert is the founding partner of iMERGE Consulting. He heads up the Institute for Governance, as I said, and he does teach uh, information governance uh, and consults with leading organizations, so he has practical experience that he's going to be able to share with us. So right now, without uh, any further uh, ado on my part, I'm going to introduce our guest speaker, uh, Robert, and uh, Robert, you can take it away. Okay. Thanks very much, Pat. Um, I'm happy to be here. I'm pleased that this is my inaugural uh, lecture at a university, so uh, you can tell your grandkids you were the first at some point, huh? Uh, so I'm, I'm really looking forward to this, and just to introduce myself, I guess, uh, as Pat said, I'm the author of uh, Information Governance, uh, Concepts, Strategies, and Best Practices, and the Managing Electronic Records book. And uh, it's been picked up by some uh, major university programs. These books are being used to teach these courses at, uh, at not only San Jose State, but the University of Oxford in England, University of Michigan, University of Toronto, NC State, University of Maryland, and a number of others. So um, I'm, I'm pleased and proud uh, with, with those developments. And uh, just to give you a little background uh, about the Institute for Information Governance, which is a uh, it's a, a practice area of Emerge Consulting, which I've been a, a founding a partner of and member of for the last 20 some years. And so I focus on information governance training. And it's uh, if you go to igtraining.com, there's more information there. And uh, I teach uh, classroom classes on site as well as uh, live online and HD video. And I have the archive sessions that are recorded for on demand. And we offer to uh, corporations and government uh, organizations uh, certificates in various uh, information governance um, um, courses. And uh, some of the, some of our uh, organizations we've done some training for already are Pacific Gas Electric, uh, NARA, uh, Tyson Foods, Warner Music, uh, Bank for International Settlements, and, and and others. So this has been I really I've been teaching this about 18 months, and the, the book has been out just uh, just about that length of time. So we're going to talk about information governance today, and uh, and I, I tell you how many conversations I've had when people kind of slip up and say, "What, what is information government? What is that?" So we'll talk about information governance. And uh, if you're looking for any uh, evidence that whether this is a trend or not, you can just look back to two, 2014, last year, and this was sort of the year that IG got launched. It's when the uh, information governance initiative. Um, uh, launched their, their uh, initiative of about 15 vendors got together and decided they needed to clarify the marketplace, um, do some research, uh, provide some e events and so forth. And that's a group of, of 15 that's grown to 25 or more uh, today. And they have a uh, Chief Information Governance Officer Summit in Chicago and that they held the first one in the spring. And in the fall, they have the Information Governance, uh, the InfoGovCon in uh, Hartford in the fall. Uh, ARMA, the Records Management Association, um, uh, had their first our executive conference on information governance. AIM launched their information governance training, which in my opinion is uh, less than, uh, it's just not as good as mine, put it that way. <laughs> uh, then. Uh, our organization launched our training, and uh, Ingenious, which is an organization out of Irvine, California, added to their e-discovery retreats, added uh, information governance, so they're moving in that direction. Um, of course, my book was published last year in April, and information governance was added to the first step of the 
of the electronic discovery reference model if you go to edrm.net. And uh, it did say information management, but now it says information governance because if you have better governance on the front end, it's going to make all those downstream processes in e-discovery in terms of finding information and producing it um, much go in a much more smooth fashion. So this didn't happen in 2013 or 2012. Uh, it did, these things didn't start to happen this year. They all happened last year. So if you're looking for a sign of, a, of, a, of an industry that's, that's taking off and growing, um, I think it's pretty clear. Now we've had some, like I think, missteps and confusion as to what information governance is and uh, you know, started with some of these um, larger consulting groups. Which, which came out with definitions like this, which cover everything in the kitchen sink, and it's probably true, but I just think it's too much of a mouthful for anyone to actually digest and articulate. So I, I wouldn't recommend you know, this definition anymore. Basically what Gartner did was they took their data governance definition and tweaked it a little bit and said, now that's information governance, but it's sort of, you know, this is what happens when you create a definition by committee. And uh, ARMA came out with theirs as well, which is similar. It's just a little less verbose, but still it's just, it doesn't say anything about risk. It doesn't say anything about cost. Uh, it's, it's, just, uh, uh, it's, it's just too much. So uh, the Information Governance Initiative came out with their definition last year, and it's really the same as what uh, IDC's was, you know, I guess four or five years ago, it's very similar, which is the activities and technologies that organizations employ to maximize the value of their information while minimizing associated risks and costs. And the reason I'm going through these newer definitions is because this, these are developments that, that have happened in the last two years um, uh, since my book was published. So in my book I offered the ARMA definition, the Gartner definition, and of several others, and I'm just trying to give you a flavor of that. Um, but this is a much more crisp definition here, so it's fairly easy to, to, to uh, take that away with you. It's a fairly easy elevator pitch to be able to say, oh, well, it's, it's, it's minimizing risks and costs of information while maximizing the value. And I, I tried to boil that down a little, distill it a little more, and I got down to the, what I, I would say that the, the most crisp definition I could get, which is security, control, and optimization of information. And it maps to the uh, Information Governance Initiative definition if you, um, if you uh, look at it. So uh, let's see here. Let's start from the uh, optimization end. So optimization, um, if you look at uh, the value, maximizing value, that means optimization. So we're maximizing value is optimization, but also minimizing costs is optimization. So we're minimizing costs and maximize, maximizing value, that's optimization, okay? And, um, and we have, uh, uh, you go to control. Control would be having your information under control, meaning you know where it is, you know who has access to it, and the proper people have the right information at the right time. You're minimizing, you're minimizing your costs when you have control. Um, you're also, when you have control of your information, you're minimizing your risks because you know where your personally identifiable information is, where your protected health information is, where your credit card information is, and you've protected that. So you have more control and you're reducing your risk. And with security, um, if, you've, if you've got security, uh, secure information, then you have got lower costs because you've reduced the cost of breaches. You reduce the impact of a, a breach when it does happen, and with greater security, information security, you have also reduced your your risks. So uh, I believe that this uh, definition maps to the IG initiative definition, but it's more succinct and more crisp, and it's easier to remember. What is information governance? Security, control, and optimization of information. And this is uh, you know after some some hard thinking over the last. Um, couple of years. So let's just look at where information governance uh, sits in this, uh, this stack of different types of governance that is often confused. Uh, first you have corporate governance which has uh, been around as long as corporations have been around and that involves 
what's called governance, risk management, and compliance. There's software for that, for GRC. And that's a very high level, of mostly we're talking about financial compliance there, risk management in a broader sense than just information risk, and, uh, and governance in a broader sense. Um, so your corporate governance has to do with your uh, shareholder agreements, your, you know, your, your board of directors uh, election, um, your bylaws, your articles of incorporation, um, you know, how you're going to run the, the corporation, the organization. Information governance would fall below that and would be, and it should be more and more I think responsibility of boards and, and CEOs and that's security control and optimization of information and we're talking about both structured information, which is databases, which, is, which, are, which are easy to, to manage relatively, uh, and unstructured information, which is everything else, your email, PowerPoint, uh, uh, spreadsheets, word processing documents, Microsoft Word, and so forth. So it's all that unstructured information or sometimes termed semi-structured because it has some metadata attached to it. Um, unstructured in general doesn't have metadata or not much to speak of. Harder to, so that's harder to uh, manage. Then you have IT governance, which is really was formed so that, I mean, in the old days, uh, 30 years ago when I started in the uh, computer business, you had these IT managers who would just go off and do their own thing and they'd be developing their own software code. They would be uh, uh, you know, not documenting it well. Um, they would start projects that senior management didn't really know what was going on and, and, and they, they needed to get a handle on it. So IT governance is about getting uh, the IT department to run more efficiently and to focus their, developmental, uh, their development and their service efforts on meeting corporate objectives. So you have um, with IT governance, you have uh, uh, some of the more popular um, frameworks are COVID, which is now COVID-5, um, ITIL, uh, COVID is Control Objectives for IT, uh, ITIL, which is an IT infrastructure library which came out of the UK, it's, more, it's the largest used uh, framework for service management in the world, and uh, there's also an ISO standard, ISO 38500, which, which all of these are compatible, they map to each other, and they're all, they all revolve around getting results from the IT department and getting them focused on objectives that, that, that the senior management can view and, and see they're making progress toward accomplishing business objectives. So it was really a way, uh, a way to do that. And then you have uh, IT governance, and uh, IT governance, I mean, I'm sorry, data governance. And then data governance is really at that raw level that of getting good quality data, uh, and, and I'm talking about numbers and letters here, getting that input. So it's, it's not only getting an input, but making sure you have data quality at that, that lowest level so that all those downstream reports are more accurate. And uh, there's software that does data cleansing, data scrubbing, deduplication. Um, there's some data gets corrupted in the course of business because you've got uh, you've got the physical movement on disk drives uh, and, and physically moving, eventually that things wear out. Eventually they might make mistakes. So there's software that can go find where there's bad data, corrupted data, strip that out, replace it with, uh, with, with new, uh, fresh, uh, accurate data. And so it's about maintaining good, clean data. And uh, Carl Thomas, who's the information governance lead for J.P. Morgan Chase, said in their information governance program, when they went out to the business units, the biggest, biggest issue that uh, managers of those business units had was information quality. They didn't trust the information they were being given, so they didn't, therefore, trust the, the reports and the analyses that were coming from that data. So it's about getting good, clean data at, at that lowest level. And I'm talking about structured data here, databases, and having it flow into reports downstream and be more accurate. So if you look at the right here, you see it, it becomes more and more specific as you move down from corporate governance uh, to information governance, IT governance to data governance. So that, um, now that you know the difference, if you ever read an article, I mean, I've seen supposed experts writing articles on information governance and, and then make the articles about data governance or, uh, you know, if you, if you buy this book, Selling Information Governance to the Business, which I thought was going to be helpful for writing my book, it's all about data governance. They did a search and replace. 
So, uh, you know, data governance is about structured data at that low level. Information governance is much higher level and it involves unstructured data and security control and optimization data. And once you get that right, it will bug you. It'll drive you crazy when you see people confusing or mixing or conflating information governance with data governance. So um, they are two different things, although data governance should be a part of an information governance program. Now, what is information governance? Uh, it's just getting your house in order. Uh, George Socia, who's a principal at, at edrm.net and one of the co authors of the eDiscovery reference model as well as the IG reference model. So it's just getting your house in order, cleaning things up. The example he gives is um, he was in his daughter's room and uh, he found a sleeping bag in her closet. And he said, now that to me, it, it didn't fit there. It was supposed to be in the basement in a certain cubby hole. Cubby hole. And then as far as the classification, that's not where I would ever put it. So I wouldn't even think to look there. And that's what happens in organizations. People file information away the way they feel like they would want to retrieve it, but other people can't find it. So you have uh, you have uh, information chaos basically because there's no structure, there's no classification, people aren't on the same page. Information governance is sort of a super discipline. It's it's made up of multiple disciplines that in in in, uh, in, in records and information management. IT, legal, privacy, security, and and risk management, and, and a number. So it, it, it just emerged in the last five years, but particularly in the last couple of years. And it, it emerged due to more and more regulations, more and more litigation, more and more data, more and more information with this big data trend. We're just hitting the, the beginning of that. They're going to be swamped with it. So organizations are looking at growth internally of you know, 40 to 50 percent a year in information, and now if they're getting to the choking point. They've been adding disk and they've been adding it, but they haven't been organizing it. Then there are big, big uh, downsides to that. If you look at uh, PG&E, Pacific Gas Electric, they had a great records retention schedule, but they weren't following it, and they couldn't produce the proper records. So they're looking at a billion dollar fine and criminal penalties because of poor information governance. Well, I can tell you right now, they have a, a strong information governance initiative going on at, at PG&E and they have a reason to do it. But they're not alone. If you look at the largest banks and the largest insurance companies, they all have the same dirty little secret in the back room behind those closed doors. It's a mess. They, don't, they can't find things. They, they've been saving it forever, 10 years or more. Even though nobody's retrieving the information, it's sitting out there and multiple, multiple duplicates and so forth. So really multiple overlapping dis disciplines were needed to address all those challenges. And so information governance includes key concepts from corporate governance, records management, information security, e-discovery, litigation readiness, all these pieces here and more, that's information governance. So you can see why it's sort of hard to get your arms around, around that. And um, the IG initiative, which does surveys and studies, just released a couple weeks ago a, uh, a study where they, they uh, it sort of solidified what is information governance, what, what are the pieces of it. And, and last year's study said about the same thing. Records and information management was most closely associated with information governance. Then information security and protection, which has kind of moved up a little bit in this scale. Compliance, e-discovery, data governance, privacy risk management. Now last year, e-discovery was about here and data governance was up here. So e-discovery moved up a little bit. So uh, just to kind of, and, and you can see if you go around here, it's, it's you know, big data and master data management analytics and so forth, all of this. And so if you kind of look at the slice of, of the first third of that, then I would say that's where you can focus, that's where you can focus on what is information governance. It's, 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 it's RIM, it's information security, it's information compliance, e-discovery, data governance, privacy, risk management, and uh, data storage and archiving means like email archiving, content archiving. If you archive in real time, you can make sure that you have captured the information without any um, spoliation or adulteration. Spoliation means it's, it, it, it was, uh, the, the information was 
possibly corrupted, changed, edited, and so forth, not preserved in its original um, uh, format, in an original form. So if you can see all of those pieces, all of these little pieces, they map to pretty much the information governance reference model, which is RIM and IT, which is data governance and uh, privacy and security, information security here, legal, which is e-discovery and, and related. And they have business here, which is, uh, you know, the business units focusing on profit. In the center of this diagram, you see sort of the traditional records management paradigm. But I've recommended that I wrote a blog post. If you go to my LinkedIn page, and I invite you to go ahead and, and uh, connect with me on LinkedIn, you'll see my uh, article that I wrote. I wrote a blog post on why the information governance reference model should have change management in it. Because you can't really do information governance without change management. You have to do the training. You have to do the communications. You have to redesign business processes and change the way people work. And so I recommended that it go outside all of this, uh, there should be a circle around it. Uh, George Selisha believes it should be in the center, but, you know, uh, nevertheless, they took my recommendation under advisement, and I, I wrote a little more detail and submitted it, and they're going to add change management, so next year it'll have change management in it. Now, what is the whole focus of information governance? The whole idea is to focus on that information that has real value. Um, they did this study, and OCEG has cited in just about every IG presentation you'll see, which is that only about 25% of information that organizations have has real business value. And about 5% has to be kept as business records, about 1% is retained for litigation hold on average. So that means, if you do the math, 69% is just costly junk. So that means you've got your IT department, and you've got high value resources there highly qualified, expensive people, and you're spending the same amount of resources and effort to manage the garbage as you are to manage the high value information, which makes no sense. It's a complete uh, misapplication of resources. And let's say they're completely off. Let's say it's not 69%, it's only 40%. Or if it's only 33%, that's still one third of your whole budget uh, of, of, of managing the data. And I'm talking about not only the the disk drives and, and the air conditioning and so forth, it's just all the overhead and the labor to, to keep that up, you know, it's just, it's really a waste. And it, most of this could be termed what is called rot. And if you haven't heard of that, rot is redundant, outdated, or trivial information. So that means, you know, they've done some different studies that, that you have these uh, copies upon copies. Sometimes seven or more copies, this is typical, you'll find in organizations. In fact, up to 40% of what's managed in organizations is just duplicates. And you don't need duplicates, you just need the one copy and you can refer to that. Uh, it's orphan content, so content that somebody created and they've left the organization three or five years ago and no one else has a use for it. Or it um, uh, was, was created with a certain application which was sunsetted or decommissioned and that it no longer applies, it's still sitting out there. Um, or you have just things that are created during the course of, the, of, of regular operations, log files, temp files, PST files. Um, then you have unknown content, which, which is also um, often referred to as, uh, as, as dark data, where it just don't know what it is. And it's kind of crazy, but uh, there, it, organizations, there's a lot of information they're managing. They're spending those high value resources managing it, and they don't know what's in there. Um, and they're also illicit or unauthorized content. So, for instance, you go into shared drives in, in large organizations and they'll have people's iTunes library on there and they'll have their, uh, you know, pictures from homecoming or the Super Bowl or whatever it might be. And um, uh, so all that needs to be cleaned up. And, and all you really need to do is go in and find out if you've got a SharePoint site, for instance, and it's, and it's not supposed to have audio files on there, you can just go in and delete those uh, uh, at will because they're not supposed to be there according to the governance of that SharePoint site. Um, so a lot of that, people say, oh, it's too much work, it's too hard, but it, it's actually, it's finite, it's, it's, it's logical, it's something that can be solved. And how do you solve it? You use software that's often termed file analysis software. 
And this is one tool you can use. It, uh, it, it, the, the longer term is file analysis, classification, and remedi remediation. Um, just to give you some examples, if you want to look up some of these companies, Acaveo in Canada. Ah, what happened to that? Um, come on, Acaveo, Acaveo, and Newix, which originally came out of Australia. Um, active navigation and, and navigation. <laughs> And there are others, and those would be some that you might also file facets. There are others. And basically what the software does is it goes out through all your shared drives and all your network attached storage and all your storage area network and looks to, 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 to do file analysis. It crawls and it looks at all of the characteristics of your files and it can locate personally identifiable information, protected health information, PCI, credit card information. You know, if Sony Pictures would have done this prior to their breach, then uh, then then they would have they would have been able to find that personally identifiable information that their employees uh, that were out there on their employees. All 3,800 some employees got their name, birth date, address, social security number, next of kin. All that information was divulged. The way you stop that is if someone penetrates the interior, I mean the exterior through their firewall, is you lock down that information with encryption. So even if they get there, they can't read it and they don't have the encryption keys. So that would save a lot of problems. But you could also find out things like the, the file type, the author, when, the last, the, when it was created, when it was last accessed. If you find out basically information has most value in the first 30 days. And if you find out that, and it goes down from there, if you find out that some of this information hasn't been accessed for 10 years, it's a good candidate for deletion. And you have to have your policies in place and okay with legal to delete this stuff, but that's what you need to do. And, um, and, and some organizations do it sort of uh, in a, a stair-step fashion. For instance, take all this information we think we should be deleting and let's, let's put it in the cloud because it's cheaper storage. And, and, okay, you people in business unit A or B, you, uh, you have 90 days to tell us whether you need this information for business reasons or not. Otherwise, we're going to delete it. So it's about the, the proper tiers of storage as well as uh, deleting. So you have tier one, tier two uh, uh, storage. So tier one would be your fastest, most expensive disk drives. That's the information you need you know, every day quickly. And you'd have tier two, which would be a little slower. You could have near line, which means somebody has to mount it. You could have offline. Um, so, so there's there's really a, a hierarchy to managing your information according to its value. And file analysis gives you this feedback to help identify uh, targets for defensible deletion, and and it gives you a, a picture of what what you your holding your information holdings are, and that allows you to create a data map or an information map so you know where your information is and, uh, and, and, and how to pro uh, properly uh, classify and manage it. Some of the more sophisticated file analysis software can actually go out there and do a content inspection on, on the content and, and, and actually start to insert metadata tags. So it can, it can actually say here's the topic, here, here's the author, here's the date. It can start to insert those tags. Um, and Oh, one thing I wanted to say about the garbage that you can find is, you know what the number one thing you found that was a garbage file at a large oil company on the West Coast? It was uh, empty Excel spreadsheets. People start a spreadsheet, they name it, and then they go to lunch and they forget about it. And then they come back the next day and they start it again. So people do these kinds of things all the time, same with Word documents. And if you can find that there's no data in there, those are candidates for deletion. So uh, back to this uh, uh, classification piece for file, uh, file analysis, the remediation part is actually starting to insert metadata tags on this content and get it organized. So it's pretty cool software. So what does information governance do? Um, the net is it, it helps you comply with global regulations. So um, you have all these, these regulatory requirements and you have to produce the records and you have to be able to prove that those are, are um, uh, have, have integrity and authenticity, and you have to produce that for regulators. 
Um, it could it help in in value based archiving. In other words, the most valuable information is is kept, and that which you don't need, the 69 percent or whatever the number is, is deleted on a regular basis. And you have a consistent process for that. Um, automate the legal hold uh, notification process. Uh, legal hold notification is sort of one of the pillars or one of the first big steps that you have to get in place with information governance um, to be able to have an efficient e-discovery process in litigation. You can uh, automate your retention management and reduce the cost of storage. And so ultimately you have lower costs, reduced risk, improved information quality, and improved business insights. So, you know, sounds great, right? So why wouldn't anybody do this? Because it's hard. Uh, what, what you really want to do is to redesign the business processes and bake in those privacy considerations, bake in those security considerations, bake in those records management considerations into the business processes. So that means it's going to require business process redesign, business process analysis, business process redesign, training and communications, so that you have consistent, repeatable processes. And, and that you're that you're continuing to standardize and, and, and have those processes embedded in the organization and, and so it becomes routine. In other words, um, what Carl Thomas and JP Morgan Chase calls routinize to routinize those processes. And that's what they strive for in terms of improving operational efficiency. Now why do organizations implement information governance? This comes from that study that was just released a couple of weeks ago by an IG initiative. The key drivers are external regulatory compliance or legal obligations. Um, you know, we have, we see this all the time. The a large top five bank that we have done some work with, um, they have estimated their risk of poor information governance at uh, over a billion dollars or more. And the reason is because the, the Citicorps and the, and the JP Morgans and the Bank of Americas of the world have already been fined over a billion. And uh, in fact, Bank of America has paid out over 90 billion since 2008 in fines and settlements because of poor information governance. So we've got all these systems, we've got great software and everything, but it's just not being managed and controlled well. Otherwise, uh, other, other drivers would be uh, triggering events like lawsuit. Big, big thing, not only the lawsuit, but when the litigation costs start to spiral out of control, that's when the CEO starts to get upset, when it, it just run away. And I'll tell you, with this big bank that we worked with, the, the legal department didn't want to say, didn't want to report how much was the cost of legal in e-discovery and break it out and how much was just regular legal fees and so forth. They didn't want to say because they want a bigger budget next year. They, you know, they all want to go with a, a bigger budget, but now there's starting to be some pressure there because it's getting to be too, too much, too high. Uh, desire to mitigate risks associated with data that could have been defensively deleted. In other words, if you go to court and you, the data is there, then and the other side uh, knows that they, you have to produce it. But if you have a records retention schedule that you follow routinely and systematically and delete that information according to the life cycle that you've stated in that records retention schedule, then you can say, sorry, judge, it's gone. We deleted that. But that's because we always do. That has a life cycle of three years and we deleted it, and this is our records retention schedule, so it's not available. So there's, there's risk out there of keeping information. And this, a lot of times, has to do with email, because that's where the smoking gun would be. So organizations might um, implement what would be um, called uh, um, um, destructive retention of email. So in other words, they'll say, we're going to keep emails for 90 days or 120 days or 180. And then after that, we're blowing it away. We're, we're deleting it unless it's on legal hold, could potentially be on legal hold, or is declared a record. So that, if that's your policy and you do it consistently, then, there's, then you're okay. You're in the clear legally. Uh, reduced storage costs uh, is another key. And then it goes down from there. So uh, often, um, Information governance projects, I, um, I taught, a, I taught a, a gentleman from the Bank for International Settlements, which is sort of the banker's bank in Basel, Switzerland. And um, what he did was they, they piggybacked on a data governance initiative 
So that, that's that's a way to sort of expand that. And we already have some budget. We already have a project going. But they also had some audit results, and that's a good way to leverage and start an, an IG initiative because uh, the audit results say, hey, we've got gaps in security here. We've got uh, privacy concerns here, and and these are the, re the the audit says this, and so let's move forward and address those concerns. And um, so. If you look at sort of the sequencing of information governance projects, this is what uh, practitioners would, would, this is how they would rank them if they had their choice. They would first create a corporate governance framework for IG. What's a, what's a, what's a, what's a framework, an IG framework? It's your steering committee, it's your executive sponsor. It's, maybe you have a chief information governance officer that you name to be the liaison for the whole thing. It's looking at best practices, it's looking at standards, and it's creating that whole framework within which you're going to make your information governance decisions. And then the first thing you would do after that is update your policies and procedures, starting with email um, and, 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 and focusing on e-discovery and, and wherever the pain points are, because information governance looks a little different in each organization. So uh, there will be different pain points. One organization might have a, a big problem in e-discovery. Uh, another organization might have a low litigation profile, but they uh, have some problems with the regulators. So uh, they, would, they would update the policies in, in that area. Defensive deletion, uh, which is getting rid of any of the, the, the data debris that you can get rid of. Data loss prevention, which is um, DLP software. Is, is software that really prevents or tries to prevent the exit of sensitive information from your organization. So you put in key words, key phrases, um, and it will look for those and, and maybe certain people uh, and, and stop it at the firewall. And this could be software, it could be a hardware device with software. It'll stop it before it exits the organization. The problem with it is sometimes they tighten it down too much and that impedes the flow of business. As, and, and then it doesn't do its job. So sometimes if they loosen it up, it's going through and it's not doing its job. So it's difficult and it's tricky. So they often will use um, a complementary technology called information rights management, which is what my safeguarding critical e-documents book is largely about. And information rights management, or IRM, is like a security wrapper that goes around a document upon creation and it follows it wherever it goes. And it, it gives, the, it, it controls the rights based on the roles and responsibilities of the person who created the document, the right to view, to print, to edit, to forward, um, and, and so forth. So if you have that software, if someone had 10,000, or let's say you're an Edward Snowden and you downloaded a million documents and you have all those and you're unauthorized, with information rights management, all those documents would be encrypted. And as soon as you try to open them, it would go to the cloud or go to a server and say, does this person have access, authorized access to this document? Yes or no? If they've been terminated, you can sort of remote control and turn off access. So it'll go back down to that, uh, that device and shred, do a virtual shredding of all those documents. So DLP, data loss prevention combined with information rights management is probably the uh, a good combination. Legal hold tracking would be the next piece they would do. They would do a legacy data cleanup and execute a big data analytics. So if, if these are some of the types of projects and, and this is sort of a, a good sequence uh, that, uh, you know, that they said they would like to do in, in, in that order. So what are some of the barriers to information governance? A lot of it is education, education and training. The other, another is siloing because you've got, all of a sudden you've got people in legal and IT and records and information management and privacy and security and they're all involved and they're supposed to work together. And I wrote a, I wrote a blog post called Information Governance is a contact, contact Sport because basically these are all people at the C level uh, that let's say your general counsel is here and your CIO is here. They're both competing to be chief operating officer or CEO. So now you're telling them to work together. Right? They're used to just telling people who work for them what to do. And they, uh, they, 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 uh, they can control that. Now you have these different groups that have to work together. So that makes it difficult. Um, then change management. So this is a critical piece. 
getting people to actually change. Um, you run into people that are two or three or four years away from retirement, they just don't want to change the, the way that they've been doing things the whole time and so forth. Insufficient, uh, uh, not addressing the IG in the, during the planning phase and insufficient funding here. So, so there's a number of barriers to moving IG forward and there have been a number of failures in information governance programs. So now to get to the crux of the matter of what we wanted to talk about today, there's a camp in the IG community who started to, and this is mostly sort of the, the big data and search people, who said, hey, you don't really need to do information governance, you don't need to do all that cleanup, you don't need to do all that classification because of, of, you know, of these, th th this, is our, this is our case. We don't know what information might have value in the future. We don't have the construct to know what might be valuable in a year or five years or even ten years. So we want to keep everything, okay? Now remember, they want to keep everything, right, including those empty Excel spreadsheets and all that stuff. Um, don't delete, they don't want to delete anything that later regulators and superiors might want in the future, okay? And they also believe that it's just not worth it from a, from a time and cost standpoint, time consuming. Politically charged because you've got legal, you've got IT, you've got privacy and security all you know, battling it out. And if they don't see a direct uh, benefit to them, or if they're not the ones that can benefit primarily, then they can drag the feet, not show up to a couple meetings, maybe kill the project, the program. The cost of storage, now here's a big one, it's funny to me. The cost of storage is effectively being driven down to zero with cloud offerings and low cost storage up front, with, and Microsoft, Apple, and Google, and those types will win. Well, Microsoft just announced this week that they used to say you could do unlimited storage on OneDrive, and now they're back to limiting it to one terabyte. Because some people were actually using it for unlimited storage. They were using you know, 75 terabytes or whatever. Uh, they're backing up the whole systems up there. So they said no. Uh, so I've got problems with that because what happens when the, they get all your information and it's all up in the cloud uh, and they change their mind, they change their strategy. And also, here's a big one, search technologies are so good, we can just find what we want. We'll just classify it and find what we want. It doesn't matter if the garbage is there. Well, I thought about this, and I thought about it for months to try to figure out how would I, you know, what would be the retort to this. So I, uh, I came up with some of these points, and there's a blog post, if you go to LinkedIn, that, that articulates this in more detail. Um, the culture, I think it sends a wrong message from senior management. Basically what it says is, we can keep our information looking like this, and it doesn't matter because we can search and find what we need. Or maybe it's like this, it's a little better organized, but you know, it doesn't really matter. So that tells your employees, we're not worried about professionalism, we're not worried about organization and, and, and efficiency, operational efficiency, when really you want, electronically, the metaphor to look like this. And it can look like this. Just like a library, when you walk into a library, within five minutes you go to the card catalog, the online card catalog, and you can find exactly what you want. Because it's orderly, it's organized, and you can find what you need. The next thing is, is poor data quality. It, you've got all this garbage out there, and, and so any, any analytics you run on it is, are going to be inaccurate. It also burdens the data scientists. So you've got these rock star hot shots that are data, data scientists, which um, uh, what they say is the worst part of their job is cleaning and organizing this data. And, you know, and, and, and when you talk about unstructured information, they can't even do any analysis on that until you get the metadata from it, right? So your metadata design has to be in place and has to be consistent and enforced. And you have to strip out that metadata to allow the data scientists to do their work. On that 98, it's 85 or 90 percent of the information in an organization is, is unstructured. Um, so they don't like cleaning it up and it just overwhelms them. You have a data quality problem. And then costs, just the cost of e-discovery. The more information, the more irrelevant information you have that you have to go through when you are uh, in e-discovery, in, in, that, in that process of litigation, the higher the cost is. Because you're paying high-powered high attorneys, in some cases paralegals, 
um, uh, uh, lots of dollars to go through it. As you go through that information, it's about $16,000 per terabyte. Now, there are some ways to offset that, and that would be using software like predictive coding, which is software that you can train to look for the right documents, and, and you can, in an iterative process, an expert can, can, for a particular legal matter, train it to go out and say, here, find this more like this and not like this, more like this and not like this. So it's a cost thing. The other piece is, is uh, storage costs. Now, if you say, okay, if Microsoft or Apple, anybody else says, you know, box even, storage is free, right? It, you think it's free. But there is a cost to it. There's somebody running those data centers. There are physical disk drives, optical drives, backup media. All that stuff costs money. So just because they haven't shifted the cost to the consumer on the front end doesn't mean it isn't there. And it also means that they can shift their model later once they have all your information. Because it's not very easy to get your information from Box to Dropbox or anything else, or you know, from Microsoft to Apple. It's just not very easy. There are no tools to do mass migration from those because it's not in their best interest to do that. Risk. You've got litigation risk that uh, is is. It means the more information that's out there, the more you'd have to produce and the more likely there would be a smoking gun that would damage you in litigation. But also just the risk of not being able to find and produce the records that you're supposed to be able to produce. And, uh, and uh, that's why these organizations are looking at billion dollar fines um, because of that. You also have um, the, the risk of information breaches. If you don't have your information organized, and there's a breach, and you find yourself in a situation like the Office of Personnel Management in the government, which had people's personal information, PII, unprotected, and people that hadn't worked for the government for 20 years, it was unprotected. And so it was released, right? Same thing with Sony. It was unprotected. That PII was unprotected, released. Now they've got big problems, and those people who's PII was released, will have problems the rest of their lives with credit and so forth. Search accuracy, the, the more organized that your information is, the faster you can, and more accurately you can search. And when you reduce that redundant, outdated, or trivial information, you can get to the, the information that has business value and improve your accuracy. And that improves the professionalism of knowledge workers and improves their ability to make decisions. It reduces the time that they have to spend searching, makes them more productive. Privacy regulations, particularly in California, once you you have to protect PII and PHI and PCI, but once you're done with it, you also have, are supposed to discard it. You're supposed to get rid of it. Once your business has uh, used someone's personal, uh, personally identifiable information, when they're finished, they're supposed to get rid of it. Okay, so you have that, and if you don't know what you have and you don't know where your PII is, then you can't protect it. Productivity, just overall reduced time to search, more accurate information, more trusted information, um, you know, closely related to the search accuracy. So there are all these reasons why just kicking the can down the road isn't a good idea from a management standpoint. Um, just bear in mind that with these breaches and um, and so forth. Uh, people are the weakest link. Something like 96% uh, of the, the cause of, of breaches can be attributed to human error. Someone made it, somebody left their laptop in the, in the car and it was stolen. Um, someone didn't realize that they left their, themselves logged on or they gave a coworker their logon credentials, something like that. So training and communications really um, are key. And I just wanted to review some best practices in your book. There are 25 best practices in information governance that were the first ones to be published. And I added three more on a blog post, and I'll probably continue to add uh, to them. And those aren't, you know, the only ones. There will be more and more that emerge. But certainly having a strong executive sponsor is the most critical and crucial uh, factor for success. Um, you also need to create an information governance framework. That means your steering committee, a steering committee that works, an executive sponsor who can drive the program on an ongoing basis for long term. 
um, at, P at PG and E Pacific Gas and Electric. Their executive sponsor is the president of gas operations. He reports directly to the CEO. That's a strong executive sponsor. Okay, um, and also you may need to make decisions on which best practices you want to leverage. The ones that are being used within your own industry are the most relevant, um, and also which standards that you might feel uh, would be would be helpful to use. And uh, cross-functional approach, you have to have people on that on that team from legal, IT, records management, privacy, security, risk management. Cross-functional approach, you need to cross-train those people so that the records management people start to understand legalese. The legal people understand more about IT and they understand more about records and information management. There has to be some more collaboration there. You need to identify your risks and rank them. You should certainly your top five risks, rank them, and the likelihood they can happen, and what the potential impact is. So there's some examples in your book. Uh, you know, let's say a data breach. If we have a breach, it would cost us five million. You know, the possibility of that happening is one percent. So you know, what would that be? A fifty thousand uh, dollar total expected value of that that breach. But um, but if it happens, it'll cost you the whole five million, right? So then you develop a risk mitigation plan. I was in New Orleans when Hurricane Katrina hit, and there was an, uh, an ISP down there, an internet service provider, who had a generator in their basement. And every year they would run off the generator for a, a week, and they tested it. And, and, and when Hurricane Katrina hit and the power was cut, they were able to continue operating. And this was critical because they were supporting clinical systems for patients in, in hospitals as well. So they actually tested their plan, and, and when, when the hurricane hit, their biggest problem was after a week, they were running out of diesel fuel, and, uh, but they were able to, uh, through, through the radio and so forth, to get some more fuel in and keep running. And also, information governance is an ongoing evergreen program. It's like a workplace safety program. It never goes away. So just remember, information governance, you just you never finish. So overall, uh, information governance is about standardization and consistency in your processes to bake in information governance considerations, and those being primarily privacy, security, records and information management, and, uh, and, and quality, information quality. You need a strong executive sponsor. Uh, it requires training and communication, so a heavy change management effort. In other words, people have to understand how it's going to benefit them, and how it's going to benefit the organization, how it's going to make their job better and easier. Um, so you'll have resistance to any change, but uh, change management is a critical component. It's a long-term project uh, program, but you need to have shorter-term projects to build some early wins. So the idea is, let's say, the first thing to do would be defensible deletion. So you could just get rid of stuff. Because that doesn't have anything to do with user adoption or training or anything else. There's no, no user acceptance, no user adoption there, except to say, do you need this for business reasons? Otherwise, we're going to delete it. So that would be a way to say, hey, look, boss, look, executive sponsor, we just deleted 20% of our information. And, and we don't need it anymore. So all that space is freed up for next year for, for good information to be stored. And so I believe overall that the keep everything approach just won't fly. It's not a viable management strategy because of the increases in, in data, information quality uh, concerns, search productivity, protecting personally identifiable information, costs, legal and regulatory risks, and, the, and potential breaches. And with that, I thank you and I appreciate your time today. Uh, it's been a pleasure, and um, we'll we'll move to questions here in the next. Please session. join me in thanking our guest speaker for this informative uh, presentation.